Hello and welcome to Faith Evolving. My name is Mary Claire and today we're going to be talking about virginity. Well, it's Virgo season. Okay, no, there's more to the video. But I will say the Latin term virgin. Back rolls. The Latin term Virgo is the root of the word virgin. So we'll take it to that constellation. Now look at these stars, look at them, look at them. If you stare long enough, maybe you'll see a young maiden because that's what a Virgo means. <laughs> Except nowadays the term virginity or just virgin in general carries so much more weight to it. And that's why we're talking about it. Virginity is a much valued like currency amongst young, you know, budding Christians. Lose it and you lose everything. You're a chewed up piece of bubble gum or a piece of paper that's been ripped to shreds. But yeah, without your virginity, you're, it's kind of communicated to you that you're utterly worthless. And generally speaking, these messages are primarily or at least more intensely communicated to young girls. And that is not a coincidence, nor is it necessarily an accident. Virginity as the concept we have today, a person who has not had sexual intercourse, is a pretty exclusionary term and it was born out of exclusionary thinking. So it shouldn't really be a surprise that it's still exclusionary. So in any sort of intellectual argument, the first thing you need to do is define your terms. And the thing about sexual intercourse is when you try to define it, it gets very complicated. You know, what needs to be inserted where to qualify? <laughs> Are people who have only ever had intimate encounters with people who have matching genitalia still virgins? What truly is like the moral difference between different hosts by different people, as long as everyone involved has expressed enthusiastic, informed consent. And honestly, why do we care so much? As long as everyone's safe, it's all a little gross to me when you break it down to just like, the physical exchange going on. It's not the most sanitary way to pass the time. But in this book, which I forgot to bring into my room where I'm recording, so I'm just gonna superimpose it or just throw in a little clip. Hi, this is the book. It's very overdue at the library. Virgin, the untouched history. Honey Blank writes, Virginity, at least in the classical canonical form, is exclusively heterosexual. Virginity is also female. The male body has never commonly been labeled as being virginal, even when it is, but rather as continent or celibate. Even within the Catholic Church, male renunciation of sex has been characterized as a matter of continence, not virginity. Additionally, virginity has never mattered in regard to the way men are valued or whether they are considered fit to marry or indeed to be permitted to survive. As a result, virgins are and always have been almost uniformly female. I mean, part of this came out of like a practicality of tracing back lineage, but we do have paternity tests now and Maury. You are not. But because of this emphasis on virginity, which we'll get more into where some of those roots came from other than the practicality thing, have born out of them these ideas of virginity tests to like prove that you're a virgin, like checking to see if someone's hymen's still intact. But the thing is a hymen can break um, just from riding a bike. And so there are all these things of like, are the tools used in like a gynecology visit? Does that make you not a virgin anymore? What about tampons? In the history of the West as well, a woman could be killed if she didn't bleed on her wedding night. This is assumed that's because she had already given it away. But before we continue, I do need to clarify some of the language that I've been using. So in the West, which is kind of the tale of history that I'm speaking from, virginity has pretty much always been about a person with a penis penetrating a person with a vagina. Now for the sake of this video, when I say women, I really mean people assigned female at birth. And when I say men, I really mean people assigned male at birth. This isn't to say that genderqueer or trans people 
didn't exist in the history of the West at all, just that in that cultural context, it was a very, very binary thing where gender roles were strictly enforced and it was assumed slash demanded that your gender had to match up with your sex organs. Now, of course, not everyone subscribed to this binary kind of ideology, but the thing is, if you did break those gender norms in the West, you usually were killed. Therefore, people who, you know, weren't women um, kind of were forced to still act as or like be socialized and operate in the world as women and the same for men. So when I say women in this video, I really mean women with an asterisk. And when I say men, I really mean men with an asterisk. To learn more about like the history of gender non-conforming people and gender queer people and trans people, I really suggest these two videos. The origin of gender, what does two-spirit mean? Watch those videos. Okay, so back to virginity and that whole Latin thing that I mentioned at the top. So the term virgin has Latin roots, which shouldn't be too much of a surprise because our story is going to pick up with the Vestal Virgins of Rome. So within Roman deities, there were three virginal goddesses and their Greek names, because I think because of Percy Jackson, those are the names that the general public might recognize more. They are Artemis, Athena, and Hestia. They did not marry and they did not have children. Now in Rome, the goddess Hestia is Vesta, and in both iterations, she is the goddess of the hearth. So the Vestal Virgins, you know, kept aflame the hearth honoring Vesta. And they were kind of chosen when they were younger girls, and they had to pledge to celibacy for 30 years. The hearth kind of protected Rome, so if a Vestal Virgin broke their vow of celibacy, they then were usually killed because it sent people into a frenzy. They were scared for their lives. You were kind of like selfishly putting Rome in danger. But the thing is, in exchange for this chastity from birth, the Vestal Virgins were able to have much more independence than your regular run-of-the-mill um, Roman wife or concubine. They could acquire wealth and also had the power to like pardon criminals. It was actually kind of a similar format to like the nuns of the Middle Ages, but a bit more selective. There were only up to six Vestal Virgins at a time, whereas there was no cap on how many nuns could exist. While both gave women the opportunity to study academics when they otherwise wouldn't be permitted to or prioritized, Vestal virgins could marry once their tenure was up, but nuns made a lifelong commitment. So either you gave up your sexuality for independence, or you gave up your independence for your sexuality. And sometimes if you did the former, you were still seen as like selfish and betraying your womanly duties. So you better be doing it for the sake of the divine. So you have a good excuse as to why you don't want to marry. But most interestingly, at least like to me, what came from the Vestal Virgins was this idea that like virgins had some magical property to them. So throughout the Middle Ages, there were like certain myths about virgins having like healing properties. One of my favorites is that the ideas of unicorns at the time were that they were like fierce and ferocious and only a virgin could tame one and they would lay their, their little unicorn heads in their laps and then someone would sneak up and, and kill the unicorn. But if you were pretending to be a virgin, the unicorn could tell and would just take their horn and just <coughs> impale you. Um, but also because virgins were seen as magical, they were a bit of a hot commodity. And there was this Hungarian duchess who got really into alchemy and killed like 600 virgins so she could drink and bathe in their blood to um, kind of keep her beauty going. Wild. The Middle Ages, wild in Europe. Um, and this idea of virgins being kind of like a hot commodity is still present today. Like we still see how that affects society. Like there's kind of a fed, not even kind of, there is a fetish, fetishization. There's a fetish of virgins and women's beauty standards highly value 
youth and looking young and youthful. Like there's whole industries about it, um, which has some pedophilic undertones. Watch these videos for more on that. And also has led to straight up pedophilia and sex trafficking because, you know, virgins are so highly valued. But important to note, they're also usually children. And it's seen as like a triumph to take someone's virginity or even still some ideas that like it will, um, it's like good luck. It's still having some like really, really negative, terrible, terrible effects. Now I just talked about the impact on women, but you're sitting here thinking, hold up. Sure, at church they laid it on like pretty heavy with the whole virgin stuff on ladies being like, you have to be a blank slate for your husband, which you can thank Freud for. Um, but the boys still had to suppress their sexuality too, telling women to cover their shoulders as to not tempt their brothers because like they're these beasts who can't control themselves. And like, if I whittle the old stick, God's gonna cry. <laughs> like not, it's not great <laughs> for men either, but like, they weren't historically, you know, like, killed for it. So, like, while women's virginity standards date, like, way, 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 way back, for men it's relatively recent. And you can see how that is kind of true in secular culture, where for women, being a virgin is seen as, like, ooh, ooh. Whereas for men, like, you're a nerd. Now, this is very anecdotal, but on a Discord call recently with some of my friends that also went to, like, single-gender Catholic high schools, I was like, did you get that messaging that God will hate you if you have sex? For my friends that went to like all girls high schools, they did. And the all boys high schools, they didn't. So that's a little something there. And like, yeah, priests and monks um, have to be celibate. But if I'm not mistaken, they can take that vow of celibacy, but have had sex before and they can still become a monk and a priest. So it's seen as like this noble choice, not this like moral requirement for being born. But this is a little different in like Protestant evangelical circles, which is kind of like that whole God will cry if you wank. So there's more of like a mutual celibacy kind of idea before you get married rhetoric that goes on. And that is actually because of the AIDS epidemic. That's when that started because people were so scared. Best way to not get it, don't have sex. Obviously that didn't work. And we could have had a lot more research about AIDS and come up with better solutions like we have now, except people didn't value the lives of the majority of people who were dying from HIV AIDS because they were gay. And so they were like, well, <laughs> serves you right, which is devastating. And we've lost like an entire generation of queer elders because of that. So yeah, instead of emphasizing virginity and abstinence only, let's value people as people and virgins aren't more magical than anyone else. Okay, my camera died in the middle of that and now two hours have passed, so I wasn't quite sure where that whole tirade was going. But basically, that's a very short, very, very surface level kind of synopsis of virginity and where it came from in the West and how it's impacted things. Virginity is made up pretty outdated. I like the term sexual debut a lot more, but that just sounds a lot more liberating and less of a loss. And also the term debut makes it seem like, oh, this is something you should take caution with and you should make sure that you are prepared. All of this is so multifaceted. If you want to learn more about creating your own like sexual ethic beyond just don't you dare do it. Check out Goddess Grey's videos. She has so many on the topic and they're all great and so good. And I'll link some of them in the description because she is gonna talk about purity culture so much better than I ever could. And they're all fantastic. Transition. Fun announcement. Yes, seminary classes have started now. That's actually um, why I was gone for two hours. I had to go back to orientation. So I'm going to be doing an every other week schedule again, just to gather my bearings. But the good news is the research for my classes likely will double as research for my videos. So get ready for some really cool content. We're gonna learn a lot together. 
but also I just started a Ko-fi. It is a resource where people can tip you know, certain content creators for their work. So if you would like to help me out, it would help a lot. You can donate slash tip to my Ko-fi, which is linked in the description. And if not, and you wanna help out in a way that doesn't have to do with your pockets, that's fine. Honestly, 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 just liking, commenting, subscribing, helps out creators a lot. So just by doing that, you're helping me out. You don't need to drop me a couple bucks. But if you did, I mean, I wouldn't complain. <laughs> but I also don't want to be a grifter. Let me know if I'm being a grifter in the comments below. Thank you all for watching. Okay, bye. It's August, the tree frogs are out. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Can you hear it?